fascinating our planet Earth, and especially the era we live in today. A scientific man has begun to travel to the far reaches of our universe and has actually landed on the moon over 220,000 miles away. We saw it live on television, and we can read about it in any library. Yet with all of our modern technology, we have barely begun to explore our own Earth below. More specifically, our oceans. Oceans that man has depended upon for our very existence for eons of time. Certainly man cannot survive without the sea, and hopefully in our lifetime, just as on the moon. We will see and read about a man placing a flag at the deepest depths of our ocean floor. Only then, perhaps, can we really start to explore, to, to learn about this world below with all its strange and beautiful creatures. In all our oceans, there is one creature that is most intriguing to man, for he holds the key that unlocks the gate to the world below. Let's journey into his domain. The sea, fascinating and mysterious to mankind since the very dawn of his beginning. The sea. In times when the world was thought flat, early man stood on the banks, the beaches, and the cliffs, overlooking inaccessible distances, thinking if one would go too far, he would surely fall off the face of the earth. Then, as civilizations began to develop, early man began to build toward the modern age as we know it today. And all over the world, seafaring men began to ponder the boundaries and the depths of his oceans. For as long as stories have been told, the high seas have remained a mystery to man. Great expanses of our coastlines and waterways are yet today uncharted. The true depth of the ocean is still unknown. Her beaches and rolling waves are beautiful to visit and to look at. But in a fit of rage, the sea storms become a killer of both man and nature. She can level cities without warning, and in a matter of minutes, destroy what man has spent years creating. Countless great ships have sailed, never to be seen again. An old lighthouse keeper once asked this question. Have you ever heard the sound of a ship dying? Pounded to bits by the waves and hurled on the rocks with her back broken? Have you ever watched helplessly while a ship sinks out of sight where it lies on the bottom for eternity, hoping and hoping that man, their creator, will somehow raise them from the grave and bring them back to full glory? It seldom happens. Yet this same ocean is a great provider of food, and new sources are being discovered almost daily. From far below the ocean floor comes oil and gas, and new fields are being discovered all the time through advanced technology. The incredible mysteries of the sea and the creatures that live there could fill a million books for the readers of tomorrow. And out of all the stories told of the high seas and man's search into her depths, 
We have barely scratched the surface of this strange and beautiful underwater world. A world visited by a few and known well by none. But from the very beginning of Yarns About the Sea, there has been one creature that has captured man's interest, imagination, and fear. He inhabits all the oceans of the world as well as some lakes and rivers. A creature worshipped as a god by some and as a demon by others. These gods or demons could be seen by anyone. There were living lords of the undersea world called deities and prayed to or devils and despised. As man began to explore this new submerged frontier, he took with him his own beliefs the sea unfolded beneath him, and from her dark, mysterious depths, he began to draw from it images of his gods, and sometimes his demons. Thinking back of man's first recorded journey into this awesome, mysterious ocean, is it any wonder that early man created his own gods and demons from the unknown depths? Many men set sail to explore the ocean boundaries, but only a few would challenge the dangers of our own Earth below. A world of extremes, where life began eons ago, where it still exists today in forms some of them are still to be known and named by man. A world where the shark, as a god or a diabolical wretch of the sea, has always been throughout history, a solicitor of death. And death, of course, has always been man's ultimate sacrifice. Far away on the other side of the world in India, the sun rises over the Ganga River where many a fisherman has lost his life to the jaws of a shark. Sometimes hundreds of miles from the ocean, the silent gods or demons of these dark waters have been known to turn the tides red with human blood. In Japan and the Solomon Islands, these eating machines were called Shark Man. Shark Man was god of all storms that come from beneath the sea. And when he became angry, he made the winds howl and the sea rage. It was his powerful magic or will that cast death on the seas and destruction upon the land. Pearl Harbor, the graveyard of countless sailors during the Japanese invasion of World War II, was once the site of human sacrifices to the hungry shark gods, threw themselves to the sharks as human offerings to bring blessings to their tribes. These shark man demons had bodies of men and the minds of the underwater tyrants. They were called Mano Kanaka by the Japanese. The legend of Mano Kanaka exists today in the Solomon Islands and the primitive areas of New Guinea. This is the land of the shark callers. These people believe that they have a mystical communication, a certain collaboration of voodoo power with these vessels of death. Thank you. 
The natives here in the Solomons, in the tradition of ancient rituals, call a shark from the depths of the sea. It is believed that the high priest may send the shark anywhere in the world to kill. To kill not only in the water, but as a manakanaka, in the form of man, even to the neon lights of any big city, or in a quiet village, or in the countryside. If you have made an enemy of the shark collars, and your death has been willed, the shark will seek you out and kill you. Voodoo legend, conjecture of the primitive mind, perhaps. One might ask, is it really conceivable that these plungers of the deep could actually be such assassins? There are many accounts of the strange and mysterious deaths of those the islanders shark callers have condemned to die even when a fortune in their native shell money could not buy back their life and if these accounts are true mano kanaka if he ever was still exists today of course on some south pacific islands the belief is reversed and it is said that bad and evil people become sharks after they die such superstitions, if indeed they are superstitions, do not strictly belong to natives or villagers. There are stories, legends, and myths about the shark between nearly all sailors of the world. Today, Far from the modernization of equal rights laws and the mechanization of super jets, in still primitive parts of the world, secret rituals are carried out to please the underwater gods. Children are tied to a stake in the water. It is believed that when the shark gods are appeased, they will cast good omens onto the tribes. And here, the children of the Lao Lao Lagoon swim every day where the waters can be called shark infested, yet they swim without fear of the shark. Here at Lao Lao Lagoon, there is still some of the most ancient rituals practiced as a way of life. In modern times, these tribes sacrifice pigs to their shark gods. But only a few decades ago, men and women alike were put to death on the altar and thrown to the sea as exalted sacrifices to the whims of great shark gods who are believed to be waiting below. But all people who live and work by the sea have their own way of dealing with these unpredictable killers of the deep. Even here, where the shark is not thought of as either a god or a demon, he is still a fearsome influence on seafaring people. The shark's infamous reputation has reached the far corners of the earth. Even his very name indicates an instrument of fear and suspicion. The English word shark evolves from the German word shirky. Shirky means villain. And the villain, maybe for no other reason than his silent, mysterious presence across the seven seas, has always been the symbol of fear and death. Villain or God, or merely the silent messenger of the unknown, the shark is respected here by the native people of Alaska. In this mystical land of icy beauty and crystal mountains, extending into the Alaska's open sea, the Clinket Indians have recorded many sightings of huge sharks. This great titan of the sea lives here because his favorite food is abundant in these waters, the seal and the sea lion.
Around the world, a shark, by his very presence in the water, has in some way affected nearly every society. Many of the most attractive resort beaches on earth for good swimming and surfing are dangerous because of him. And the fact is, sharks have made fatal attacks on people in every ocean of the world. And out of more than 300 species known to man, there is one that is considered to be the most fierce man-eater of all, the great white shark. to photograph the great white is a major effort. Every detail is important and we check several times. These metal cages are specially made for the job and work much like a submarine with ballast tanks for submerging and surfacing. They are an absolute must working in great white territory. dangerous of all the sea's exterminators that man has to face since he began to explore the ocean floor. The great white weighs thousands of pounds and reaches lengths of up to 30 feet. He can swallow a human being whole or bite him in half. He is the undisputed monarch of them all and rules the sea from the United States to the depths of the Indian Ocean. But there is no known place on earth where the master pirate of the deep is more plentiful than here cool waters that flow from Antarctica and lap against the magnificent shores of South Australia. Sharks have always been plentiful in these waters, especially the Great White, and precautions are necessary to protect the beaches. These signs tell the swimmers and surfers where they can swim. No dogs are allowed on the beach, for the bark of a dog is much the same as a barking seal or a sea lion. The great white shark has chosen them for his favorite food. These friendly creatures are the distant cousin of the dog, so the well-meaning yap of a poodle could turn a shark-free beach into a shark-infested area in a matter of minutes. Guards watch constantly for sharks. Planes and helicopters patrol the shoreline, and if a shark is spotted, a loudspeaker from the aircraft warns the swimmers of the danger. Okay, let's try it. Try it, try it. And these waters are especially dangerous. For sharks, even giants as large as the great white have attacked people in as little as four feet of water, a dying fish, or an injured sea lion. He can detect such disruption in the water up to a quarter of a mile away. Perhaps these children resemble seals to him. Many shark experts believe it is possible that he is even sensitive to the frightened 
or anxious beats of a rapid heart. And in nearly all cases, the victims never see the shark that made the attack. attitude and swimming in numbers are the best shark repellent that has been invented up to now but certainly no guarantee of safety as shark victim and professional diver Henry Borst can attest to there were about about 40 of us on the boat and uh, we had planned to go to a seal colony uh, off the Western Australian coast to do some diving. There were only about 10 to 15 divers on board. And uh, we'd suited up and gone in the water and I was with two other chaps in the water when, uh, you know, we were playing with some seals. They're very, very friendly. They're uh, very playful and they frolicked all around us and we were diving down and following them. And we'd been playing with them for some 10 to 15 minutes when uh, when they disappeared. And this got us a little bit worried. Uh, we started to look for the seals, we couldn't find them. And this in itself was a little strange and we decided to dive down and look for them. And we dived down in turns and there, uh, I'd just come up from a dive uh, when the shark hit. Just out of nowhere, it hit like a train. He grabbed my leg, pulled me under, and shook me from side to side. And he had me under for maybe something like a minute and a little more. And uh, I was more concerned about drowning at that moment than I would have been about the leg. Uh, it, it was then that everything went quiet. And I realized I was free, and I fought my way to the surface for a breath of air. And on my way up, I fell around the leg and realized that uh, the leg had been severed and there was no leg there. When I got to the surface, uh, there was one of the other divers there and I grabbed his shoulder and said, uh, shark, shark, you know, I've been attacked by a shark. And then realized that he wouldn't be able to see much because of the, uh, uh, the blood in the water. Uh, the shark had stuck around and circled and the other two guys uh, sort of kept it away. realized that you're in some great trouble. The boat had also realized I was in trouble and uh, had moved toward us and the two other chaps jumped in the water and assisted getting me on board the boat. There wasn't much pain at that time because the, uh, the shock had completely taken over and it all sorts of feel, feels as though it's happening to someone else. Uh, they got me on board the boat and tied a, a tourniquet up on my stump to stop the bleeding. Um, and then it was another hour and a half trip back to shore before they could get me to a hospital. We had managed to get the uh, doctor on the radio and he was ready with an IV and according to him I'd lost six and a half pints of blood, which is quite a lot. Well, they got me to the hospital. I spent two weeks there after I was cleaned up and uh, healed up spend another two weeks at home before I decide to go back to the water. Of course I'm still diving, still enjoy diving and still dive regularly. Is he a man of Kanaka? A god? A demon? Or Lucifer's playmate? In nearly every modern community of research and science, the shark is considered something else altogether. He is called an eating machine. A thoughtless scavenger of the sea who has no fear of man at all. A living robot who kills. And so, all sharks even though there are only 27 known man-eating species, are thought to be nothing but indiscriminate and senseless killers. Of course, they are not. But still, beware. They are truly the pirates of the deep.
The Great White, master pirate and rogue on the seas, is credited with countless attacks on people. But in South Africa and Australia, there are many recorded attacks and actual sinkings of boats. In January 1976, Nicky and Paul Bowles were fishing off the shore near Durban, South Africa, when suddenly a great white went completely berserk and charged toward their boat at great speed, leaping high into the air and landing in the fish well. His head bashed through the wall of the boat, momentarily stunning the monster. This allowed the shocked fisherman time to grab up a deck spear and ram it through the shark's brain. Less than a month later, E.C. Lando's boat was rammed by a great white and just barely made it back to shore. Captain Alex Mamakos was severely injured when a great white leapt into his boat and landed on top of him, crushing his pelvis and rupturing his bladder. But regardless of the many dangers, in the salty waters of the world, the mysterious beauties have lured curious men and women since perhaps the pre-dawn of history. If you have never had the opportunity or the training to dive below the surface and remain there for a time, this environment is like, well, like no other on Earth. This fascinating world is virtually unknown to most people for lack of experience and proper equipment to survive. But oftentimes, it is truly the feeling of being in nature's womb, a peacefulness, incomparable and unattainable, anywhere above the surface. Sometimes in this inner space, where overwhelming beauty is beheld at every glance, a person can easily feel that this submerged wonderland is his forgotten home. From the very beginning of childhood dreams, it has been man's fantasy to discover a scene like this, to spend a day or a week at a beautiful ocean paradise, perhaps along a stretch of rugged coast where one would like to think man is not being. For there are still today places like this, but they are rapidly disappearing. Through storybooks of man and nature, man and the sea, people have shared many experiences like these, but only a few are lucky enough to witness such spectacles as this. sea lions, but sometimes the most fierce looking beasts are like old friends.
A person can only ponder God's underwater universe so free, so filled with joyful beauty. A world of playful fish, and yes, so seemingly peaceful. But this world below is every bit as complex and amazing as the earth above and beyond to the frontiers of space. Here, as in all wildernesses, there are dangers. This stonefish is deadly. He inhabits the waters of the Pacific to the Red Sea and has maimed or killed unaccountable amounts of people. Practically impossible to see should you accidentally step on him. Your fate is probably assured. You will be either dead or paralyzed. This toadfish is absolutely harmless. That is, unless a net fisherman includes him in his catch by accident. Entire families, mother, father, and children have died together, each thinking that anything caught in the sea is edible. Unusual? Not really. Around the world, there are many different kinds of poisonous fish. So many, in fact, that even today, commercial fishermen are still finding species yet unknown to man. But nature has chosen poison as a defensive weapon for many of her underwater creatures. This lionfish, extremely dangerous to men, belongs to the family of rockfish. There are as many as 300 species. 82 of the species make their home in northern waters. Beautiful to look at, but absolutely harmful to come in contact with. Closer to the surface, there are yet other dangers. The odds are against it, but should you be bitten by this sea snake, you will probably die. He ranges off the coast of northern Australia, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. He can be deadly. However, it is generally believed that a proper wetsuit is sufficient to protect a person from his bite. Regardless of the danger, the adventurous diver should be aware that in the Solomon Islands, like the shark, the sea snake is considered a god and is protected by law. You are not allowed to harm them. In spite of the risks, man continues to explore the silent depths. Not only do the rewards outnumber the perils, but even if they didn't, it is the very basic nature of man to be curious. Even here, one cannot help but wonder what splendors or dangers may be encountered. As even today, new species of animals are being found on Earth, most certainly there are many unheard of species living in these depths, perhaps only a few feet beyond the reach of today's explorers. Species even more unique than this, a relative to the Colacanth. He was plentiful in the oceans 300 million years ago. In the records and files of science, he became extinct millions and millions of years ago, but then he appeared alive and well in a fisherman's net. It happened off the African coast of the Comoros Islands. As he is now, he has been for at least a quarter billion years, unchanged even by the suspected demands of evolution. So is it any wonder that man would be drawn to this mysterious world and not marvel at its secrets? There may be, of course, any number of sea monsters and supposed prehistoric and extinct giants yet to be discovered. But like the Colacan, this old sea parrot has also swam through the loops of evolutionary change. Possibly the only difference between the sharks of today and the sharks of 50 million years ago is that there are more of them. And perhaps they may be smaller. shark is born solely to be an exterminator. But are the master exterminators really the villains of the underwater world? Without doubt, the shark is probably the most feared and hated creature known to man. Even scientific man has termed him an unpredictable killer. But is he? A question well worth examining.
For the shark might just be the sea's major contributor, not to death, but to life. If he was a mindless, indiscriminate killer, this diver would be dead, ripped to bits in a matter of minutes. He is a scavenger, but then again, it is in the pirate's nature to hunt and to ransack, to destroy and forever remain a scoundrel. The shark is all of that. But is he a frenzied killer who, in his madness, buries his teeth into anything that moves? Many say he is. The facts are that he is duty-bound by nature to take care of the sea. Still, no living thing in the world, it seems, is looked upon with such vehemence and fear as the shark. And regardless of man's computerized knowledge and all his technology, his superiority stops here, at the surface. Once he enters the water, it is man who is alien here. A stranger in a strange environment. This world belongs to him. The Great White, the African Raggy, and the 300 and more known shark species. 27 of them are known man-eaters. Now let's study the Great White as man enters his domain. He is more fearsome than the Mako, the Tiger, the Hammerhead, the Grey Nurse, the Lemon, the Nicaragua, the Port Beagle. All known man-eaters. None, however, can claim the human victims that the Great White has swallowed. It's not warfare and bloodshed, of course. There are creatures and places here of unforgettable eloquence. as with people. Not all stout and kind hearts are packaged in beauty. This frightening creature is a ray, a relative to the shark. He's not very pretty. But, like the ugly duckling, he accepts friends readily. Well, there are exceptions, of course. Some rays are cranks. Mostly they're easygoing and don't mind looking for a free handout. All in the sea is not so friendly, but this so-called villain is more of a saint to nature than most people think. Ironically enough, by his seemingly evil ways, he becomes the champion environmentalist of the sea. He is responsible for the very hygiene of his environment, for without him, there would be a far more dangerous criminal in the waters a mass exterminator, disease. But the shark preserves many ocean species by selecting the sick, the weak, and the dying to eat. This is truly his mission in nature's underwater scheme. And so ironically, the fearsome killer of the deep also becomes a survival machine. Because he is a giant scavenger, he greatly reduces yet another enemy of all living things, pollution. In this once clear, clean water, it would seem a missed opportunity not to remark on thinking creative and scientific man's inability to control the pollution in his own environment. And sadly enough, his pollution is seeping into the oceans. 
Man, however, is not a deliberate spoiler, leastwise most of us. Waters like these began being polluted long before he realized he had to preserve his oceans. But since man is the ultimate creation, he must ultimately take responsibility for the world he's been given and do something about it. Not only does the shark contribute to life in his own environment, but new studies show he just might become a strong contributor to the life of man. There's something uniquely fascinating about these giant assassins that has gone unnoticed up to now. Through research, scientists have learned that sharks are extremely healthy. In fact, they are practically immune. Yes, immune to nearly all disease. Their blood contains natural antibodies that scientists believe can and will help in the curing, or at least the immunization, of such dreaded foes as cancer in human beings. But in nature's own way, and perhaps in her unexplained wisdom, the shark begins his pirating of life, even in the pre-dawn of birth. Sharks are the only known interuterine cannibals in the entire animal kingdom. While some species are still in the womb, they attack and eat one another. There's about one shark out of three born from an egg. This is the Port Jackson, a uniquely shaped pirate not anticipated to be a danger to man. This is a shark egg capsule. It resembles a spiral shell and contains a shark embryo with its yolk sac. But there's more to learn about all the strange and complex lives of the sea's predators. For example, not all live in the open waters of the oceans. In these enclosed freshwater lakes of Central America, the mighty Nicaragua dwells. He's a known man-eater and has killed innumerable numbers of people. But this is his kingdom, and here below the surface, he rules these freshwater depths. These rulers in freshwater or in saltwater depths of the oceans are not indiscriminate eating machines at all. When it comes to menu, man is on this Goliath's list. There are many documented attacks on people made by the awesome hammerhead. He is found in many waters of the world and is plentiful in the oceans of the United States from California to Cape Cod. The unique shape of his head makes him different than other sharks, but his temperament is the same. He is a born pirate, an exterminator for nature. smaller than the great white, or tiger sharks, but he attacks with force, tearing away at his victims much in the same manner as a cat holds a mouse in his mouth and swings it from side to side. The hammerhead can as easily do the same thing with a human being, and he has. In fact, the hammerhead is at the top of the list as a potential danger to human life. For one thing, he may be the best navigator in the water. Some scientists and biologists believe that the hammerhead's strange appearance is the result of evolution's ultimate design and that one day all sharks will look more like the hammerhead. Although the shark has remained pretty much the same for millions of years, those who fancy the great chain of events of evolution, scientists and scholars, tell us the shark began much like this with a hard shell covering 
with his skeleton on the outside of his body. Then a mere quarter billion years passed, and the shark gradually became something more needed by nature. It begins, I suppose, with the unfolding of life. A most miraculous process, then change. This monster of the great evolutionary chain of events grows to be more than 50 feet long. He is Rinkadon Typhus, the whale shark. Incidentally, he is not related to whales. He's a good-natured, kind of a charming big brute of the open seas. And what a brute he is. A titan weighing tons. Luckily, he has no inclination to fit man into his diet. He is less abundant than other sharks and may be at the last link of his existence. There have been larger sharks, of course, that lived long ago in these waters. Our gargantua, now extinct, was twice the size of the whale shark, up to 90 feet in length and could easily have swallowed an entire family on a small craft wife, husband, and children. He is, by the way, a direct ancestor of the Great White. The oceans and river beds in the United States are one of the most plentiful places on Earth for the finding of sea fossils. Below, on the Atlantic side of the United States, is Florida. Paleontologists believe that during the Miocene epoch, when the state was still submerged, these waters were a meeting place or spawning ground for the prehistoric giants of the sea. The Megalodon shark. Throughout history, Fossil finds and the museums that house them have always been a major contributor to our history books. For example, take large teeth like these. From these actual teeth and other finds related to it, scientists have been able to reconstruct the actual jaw of the megalodon. the size of his jaws, they've been able to establish that he grew to be more than 80 to 90 feet long and that he was plentiful in these waters. The Megalodon shark, extinct, gone from these waters forever? Perhaps, but can anyone say for sure? One only needs to remember the Colacanth was supposed to be extinct millions of years ago, but he wasn't. Is it not possible, then, that these prehistoric giants are now still living somewhere, perhaps? Only a few feet deeper than today's explorers have gone? Research about the sea's most famous pirate is a subject that has long since been of great interest to all seafaring people, as well as scientists. Here off the coast of South Australia, at the location of many great white sightings, blood bags are dropped, weighted down with horse meat. This experiment was carried out a few days following the migration of the seals and sea lions from the area. surprising as well as negative with the absence of the seals and sea lions there were no great whites even with a large amount of food dumped to them over the three-week day and night intensive test period this experiment strengthened our belief that the great white travels with the migrations of the animals and perhaps one day through relocation efforts of seals and sea lion colonies we can not only predict shark travel patterns, but greatly reduce shark attacks on human beings.
What summons a shark? How does it know there is possible prey nearby? And from what depths can he raise from? From research, we know he will react to the smell of blood in the water, and his system can home in on vibrations perhaps miles away. Organs called ampullae of Lorenzini, located in pore-like openings in the shark's snout, act as electroreceptors. It is guided by these that sharks locate their prey and orient themselves in their long-range travels, locking in on the Earth's electromagnetic field. Here, we will join a scientific experiment to catch and land a giant great white for study purposes. to a 40-gallon drum with a steel cable attached to the board. The great white has taken the bait and will plunge several times toward the depths, pulling the 40-gallon drum down with him until eventually he will tire himself out so the crew can lift him aboard. White is finally ready to be pulled aboard. But first, what an opportunity to study the greatest of all the pirates of the deep. He has jaws that can bite down with 6,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. With ropes now secured around his tail, he can be lifted up for a better look. He has rows and rows of teeth, six rows to be exact. In case he loses one in battle, another one will move forward to take his place in a matter of a few hours. Even in his final moments of defeat, he will not give up. With the signal passed to hoist him up, he clamps his powerful teeth on our cage. The hoist crew cannot lift him with his weight and that of the loaded cage. One hour passes. Two hours. Finally, the great steel jaws unclamp and the deck crew heaves hull. Victory is in sight. We have conquered the great white. His mighty fighting spirit, his willpower not to give up cannot possibly save him now. Then the unbelievable happens. The powerful bull blocks give way. Unable to lift the great white, he crashes back into the sea, gone forever. Wait, not quite. 
An evil eye is cast at the deck crew and perhaps a final warning to the divers. This is my domain and you had better stay in the cage. The most effective measures in existence against sharks are these underwater guard fences or nets. There are a number of them built off the shores of Australia, but without a doubt, the most impressive beach net in the world is in South Africa. For it is here, off the shores of Durban, South Africa, that man, in order to enjoy this, perhaps one of the most beautiful paradises on earth, has been forced to wall off from the open sea virtually every resort beach covering 400 miles of shoreline. Today, thanks to the Natal Anti-Shark Board headquartered here in Durban, the beaches are safe for the $500 million tourist business that comes to this beautiful shore. But it wasn't always like that. Black December, as it came to be called, started on December the 18th, 1957, at exactly 5 p.m. in four feet of water. In the words of Roberta Demerick, this is what happened. I didn't see the shark coming, but there was nothing I could do anyway. The shark grabbed my leg and, and surged through the water with great speed with, with me in its mouth. He shook me violently. All of a sudden, I was free, and I began to splash and scream for help. I don't remember too much after that. Mr. Holy came and got me. Hundreds of people gasped at the horrific sight as Roberta was carried onto the boat. Her left leg was bitten off at the knee. Black December had begun. There followed in just over one month, seven fatal attacks. Tourist beaches of South Africa faded into history. Hundreds of businesses, hotels, restaurants, and beach resorts went out of business. There followed several years of community effort, study, and worry of how to protect South Africa's beaches so they would finally be safe for swimmers and surfers. A decision was made to net the beaches with a full-time year-round operation. In 1964, the Natal Anti-Shark Board was formed. In those early years, it was trial and error. Months and even years of study, plus a very important factor. The input of knowledgeable fishermen skilled at handling nets went into this combined effort. first nets used proved to be successful except for the great white. With his superior power and cutting teeth, he laid havoc with these early attempts. It became evident that better nets were needed to stop this monster pirate. For every one caught, another one got through. Beulah Davis, director of the board, personally took an active role in the field operations. A decision was made. They would make their own nets using the experience gathered by the field team and from old-time fishermen. Today, the Natal Anti-Shark Board knows as much about sharks as any study institute in existence. 
They are the foremost authority on many factors pertaining to shark behavior. Keeping pace with the times, they are fully computerized. Their vast netting operation and research program give up-to-date facts about shark behavior along the entire South African coastline. Most of all, due to this program, shark control in South Africa is highly successful. However, quite often when a shark is caught, that is not one of the man-eating species, the team will turn it free. Daily catch taken out of the nets that protect the beaches is a grim reminder that sharks here are a danger to bathers and surfers. It should be remembered that nature's greatest achievement is balance. And the shark's mission in nature is to seek out and rid the waters of all things in trouble. Even when it is their own kind. A very important part of the shark team's work is the dissecting of the large ones and of all the man-eating species. This gives information that helps the shark team in their everyday work. Belly content can tell where the shark has been ranging. Temperature tests taken at the time of capture combined with the shark's diet and the area of the catch can mean immediate closing or opening of a beach. Information gathered from the dissecting tables can alert the team of shark movement to a given area. Over the years, and through research, water temperature has been directly connected to shark attacks here in South Africa. Perhaps for two reasons. Warm waters bring out large crowds to the beach, and it also brings certain schools of fish into the shallow waters. These two factors over generations of time are certainly inherent in the migration pattern of sharks. They do move with the changing temperature of the water and they also migrate with certain species of ocean life. Quite often that ocean life inhabits shorelines close to popular surfing or bathing beaches. is warmer than 70 degrees. The anti-shark crews work almost day and night in the murky waters, quietly and without ceremony, pulling nets, resetting, and clearing the nets set the day before. These nets, loaded with dead sharks, caught in some cases only moments before, are within a hundred feet of a swimming and surfing beach. There are man-eaters nearby, as these carcasses are mute testimony. The divers work early in the morning before the good light, hoping to clear this horrific scene before the beaches are loaded with thousands of swimmers and curious onlookers. Sharks are caught in these nets for one reason only. They are the only divider between busy beaches crowded with people and the shark-infested waters only a few feet away. The dive team that tends these nets must be constantly on guard to the dangers of their job. Some of the team members have been working together for 20 years. They know through experience that a big shark caught in the net can play dead, hoping that for just a moment, 
One of the divers might forget and pass too close to its mighty jaws. In most cases, the work is hampered by marginal visibility, and coordination between the topside crew and the divers on the bottom is mainly achieved through a common timing acquired after many years of working together. Heavy shark activity can rip the nets to pieces. They must be cleared rapidly and reset in order to keep the beaches secure for the visitors. The large sharks are sometimes as long as the boats. In many cases, large rogue sharks can actually be traced by identifiable markings on their body. They've been known to patrol certain waters for years, bumping into boats and scaring people. In many cases, they have even been given a name and are well known and feared by professional fishermen. This large shark has been observed for more than two hours without moving, seemingly dead. But he proves to be very much alive and dangerous. safety precautions are mandatory to ensure that a live shark is not pulled aboard. Clearing the nets with man-eaters, perhaps watching from nearby, calls for calm nerves and dedication. who don't believe that sharks eat people, here is proof beyond question. This human skull, a few days old, was removed from a large shark by the net team during a normal work day. South Africa's shoreline is a dangerous place to work. The water is at best always murky and the sea is rough. The huge breakers along its entire shoreline calls for the very best in boat captains and crew. The work begins before daylight and sometimes never ends. different things to different people. In South Africa and Australia, they are a menace to the beach. Visitors as well as workers, the men who make their living from the sea. But to the natives of the Solomon Islands, sharks are intertwined with their religious beliefs. 
The waters off their shores are shark infested, but the natives safely swim among them and worship them as gods. Why they are not attacked is probably a question that will forever go unanswered. Perhaps these unanswered questions are what drives man to explore the sea and endure the dangers of being eyeball to eyeball with the great white. One cannot help but wonder who was the first to enter his domain. Certainly there have been photographers like ourselves whose real pay is the excitement. Sport divers whose sheer love of the sport lures them to the deep. Those who dive for science and research, the collection of specimens and the stocking of food banks with the computer's favorite diet data and those who go to the sea for the sheer love of danger and excitement since the beginning of time there have always been hunters spear fishermen who fish for sport as well as food Weekend divers, housewives, executives, mechanics, and workers of the deep. All driven, for one reason or another, to the mysteries of the sea. Regardless of the dangers, there is one driving force that has lured man since the beginning of time. A force far greater than the finding of treasure or the thought of striking it rich. Yes, man has entered the sea for all of these reasons. But perhaps the most gallant is man's never-ending desire to explore for greater knowledge to discover and learn regardless of the dangers. Man still has a lot to learn about shark behavior. Some scientists say sharks, unless provoked or threatened, will shy away from man. All scientists agree, though, the great white shark is in a category of its own. He is the fiercest and most aggressive of all sharks. In this experiment, we witness probably one of man's first attempts to hand feed a great white in open waters. It is through experience like this that we will learn more about shark behavior. It is impossible to contemplate such daring and bravery without remembering the first divers, inventors of the pre-war diving lung, and all those that have followed to learn more about the seas. In recent years, there has been an added reason for diving into these shark-infested depths. The harvesting of one of the sea's most sought-after delicacies and a favorite on gourmet tables around the world, abalone. 
For it is here that the professional abalone divers work alone in depths of up to 140 feet. Men like Norm Craig, who work day after day and year after year off the dangerous Australian coast in waters that have claimed many a diver's life. One hazard of their job is the length of time they must stay underwater to make their catches, or picks as they call it, worthwhile. Most have suffered the dreaded diver's disease, the bends, at least once, and there are other repercussions to their health. But their greatest worry is the great white shark, the white pointer, as they call it. If you are an abalone diver long enough, you will have at least one close call. Every abalone diver knows that. It comes with the job. In all the years I've been ab diving, the closest encounter I've had with a white pointer was when I was filming with a camera crew about two years ago. We were in a cage for about an hour or so, and from nowhere, this monster appeared above us. He was the biggest shark I've ever seen. He wasn't like the others. It seemed like he was there for a purpose. As if he'd made a choice to get us out of the water and to destroy us. He attacked the cage and tried to tow us away. He went for the cables holding the boat as if he knew they were supporting us. He took hold of the lines and shook them. He tried to bite through them and tried to swim away with us in tow. They look more like something out of prehistoric times, attacking us with reason. A number of times we felt like the cage was lost with us in it. to break into the cage by banging into us with his head. We were lucky that the shark didn't drag us under because we had a strong cable attached to the boat. After that experience, I'm convinced that pointers do think, and they are, the most dangerous things to ab divers. I've been diving here professionally for 14 years, and I can tell you for sure that white pointers are a real problem here. Apart from the fatalities to abalone divers, they're a menace to all fishermen. They rob long lines and they tear fishermen's nets to pieces. We've had so-called conservationists come down here and tell us that these sharks shouldn't be killed and be given free range. If they're not dangerous, why has every coastal city in Australia got shark nests to protect swimmers? Serious scientific studies and years of research diving are enhanced greatly by the knowledge of men who live day after day with the great white in his waters and mostly on his terms. I was associated with, Terry Manuel, lost his life to a white pointer. He's working in the area near Streaky Bay in shallow water and he came up and he yelled out shark to his crew hand. From here the crew hand went back, crossed with the boat to where Terry surfaced. There was a pool of blood around him but by the time the crew hand got the Terry over the side his life was already gone. Out of all those who make their living from the sea, many have quit. After 14 years of swimming around out there with those guys, I've had enough. 
but at least for the time being anyway. But somehow the sea always lures them back, perhaps just to give danger one more punch on the nose. well equipped for the fight to fulfill his mission as being nature's pirate for the good of the seas. Our cage is made of strong aluminum and will protect us as long as nothing goes wrong. As always, the biggest underwater danger is to feel too secure and forget that man is the outcast here and we must remain a careful little stranger. great white. This incredible creature has defied evolution throughout the ages. He is well over a ton of titanic force and bulk muscle. chosen these old pirates to tend to her needs. In the Solomon Islands, we have seen the people swimming without fear of sharks, and off the coast of Florida, shark attacks are practically non-existent. Yet in Australia and South Africa, as well as other places in the world. Sharks are a constant threat to the people of the sea. What are the answers to the shark problem? And what is man's role in achieving a better understanding of them? Is it any wonder that they so furiously protect what belongs to them? For as long as stories will be told about the sea, a question will forever be asked, who are the real pirates of the deep?